Uh, we're, uh, we're here. You're here and I'm here. We're excited to be here. This is my grilling, my grilling cards. Um, that's a very, very scary name. Uh, uh, hi, Ron. <laughs> Good. Um, so when I got asked to do this, I was really flattered, and um, I started studying uh, the legendary Ron Meyer. And the first thing I thought is, well, I'm going to put a bunch of questions together, and I'll send him over and uh, make sure he's okay with them. And so I put my questions together, and I sent him over, and the response I got is, I don't want to see any questions. So I just, I want you to be all aware that there's nothing, nothing in my stack here that he's prepared for, um, which I thought was very cool. And um, the other thing I kind of found out, and the kind of shape I want to give this conversation, is as uh, I talked to several of your colleagues about you, and as I was thinking about you in your career, there are two things that kept coming up. And the first thing is, as I know from a, from a producer talking to an executive, you never are in a meeting with an executive where you, the executive doesn't say, oh, if I'm here next year. And executives in Hollywood generally are, it's like musical chairs. And you've been at the same place for, for over 20 years, which is amazing. So we're gonna try and get to the secret of, of how that happened. And the second thing is that it happened to you and you're nice. <laughs> And that is uh, very unusual in corporate America, extraordinarily unusual in Hollywood, and I'll leave it at that. But those are the, uh, the two kind of themes I want to go into, and we'll, we'll dig into them more specifically. But I wanted to start by just saying, I want to go into longevity and then being nice. Oh, and then I, I, I wanted, I'm going I'm to shut up in a second because I'm supposed to be asking questions, not talking. But when uh, I thought I would start, start off kind of a general question that encompassed both of those things. This is from Jeff Schell. He said, he suggested I ask one question. How does, a Jewish, how, how does a Jewish kid drop out of high school, join the Marines, run CAA, and then run Universal? <laughs> Which I thought, was, I thought was a great question. Is that an answer but, to the uh, question? No, no, no. This, the, question, the first question is, how do you think you've managed to stay at one place for so long when no one else has seemed to have been able to figure that out? Well, I, is this, am I doing this right? Does it sound right? Uh, it, it sounds like, like a self-deprecating answer, but in, in truth, uh, you know, I've had six owners in 20 years, and I honestly believe, and I, I, I really mean this, if I had one owner for the 20 years, I probably would not have survived. But each time a new owner came, no owner has stayed more than three years, um, three and a half years. So each time they sold the company, they actually, I believe, and I think I did a good job, so I don't think that it was just, you know, I, I, they just did it out of some, you know, need, but I think they, in making the transition needed somebody that had some sense of the place and some longevity and so each time they made a transition uh an ownership transition i you know renewed my contract but there's but usually i mean a lot of studios have changed owners and usually when they change owners they change people running the place is there is there some way you well what was the uh who's the second best owner of uh of uh, of universe who is the second best you know well that's a tough question you know, I'm very, GE was one of our owners. I'm very friendly with Jeff Immelt still. Uh, Barry Diller was one of our owners for about a year, and we're very good friends. Um, uh, Edgar Bronfman, who hired me originally from Seagram, and I are still friends. Um, so, I, you know, it's an interesting. I mean, since Comcast is now our owner, they're all our second best owners. <laughs> you know, in reality, I mean, in truth. Uh, and they were all, they were fine. Each one brings something different and each one in many ways took something away from the company. What do you think the, um, the hardest of the six owners that you had, what do you think the most difficult new owner was, the transitional period in those, in those six and, and why was it? Well, probably the French, you know, there were two complete Vivendi's. And so, although there, there was a lot of good things that came from Vivendi, the problem is they were, they, they were a French water company and really didn't understand Hollywood or our business. They, they have since learned in many ways, but they went through their own transitions. So we first had Jean-Marie Messier, um, uh, who bought, basically merged the com his company with Seagram and ultimately took it over and ultimately uh, lost it completely. And then th there was another transition from Jean-René Fortou, uh, who took over and there was entirely new Vivendi uh, uh, leadership. And that's, always, that's difficult to explain to a, a French conglomerate, a water company, 
what and why we are and, and you know, the movie business, so to speak, and the television business and what have you. So that's probably the most complicated, although they're, and, and you know, they all brought, as I said, each one had some good traits and each one's had things that were probably complicated. And how do you think you're able to, how, when, you, when, a new owner, when a new owner comes in, do you, how are you able to educate and also at the same time kind of answer to? How do you, how do you, how do you manage those two things? Well, I mean, you're, you know, first you work for them. They're your boss, so they own the place. I always say they can turn it into a parking lot if they want. It's their place, it's their show, they can do what they want to do. Um, you know, they, they, they come into a culture that exists, and the challenge is to really kind of maintain the culture and give them still what they want. And it's a very fine line. I mean, it's always hard to explain how you do it. They're, they're a great people at the studio, and fortunately we have not had, although people would think we've had a, a certain amount of turnover, the truth is, we really have not had a lot of turnover in the studio. Um, there's a, a, a strong continuity of management and continuity of, of executives in that studio and who've done a pretty good job, really great job in my opinion. Uh, my first two years there were really failing years and I was fortunate to survive them. In the last 18, we've had great success and it really is due to the, to the team of people that are there. And so each owner comes in and they, they're they're all smart enough not to really fix what's broken, even though they do want to make some changes, and they're entitled to make some changes. They have left us to kind of run the studio the way it had been run, because they bought it, not because it was a company in distress, but because it was a profitable company. Well, I think, um, speaking from experience, you definitely run the studio differently than other studios are run. And one of the things I read about a lot when I was, uh, when I was Googling you was, um, was all the, you've talked a lot about, in the past, about the importance of kind of a good corporate culture. And I would love to know um, from you, like, what is your definition of a good corporate culture, and what's your definition, uh, kind of, of a bad corporate culture? Well, you you said at the beginning, you know, you, you're a nice guy and you survive. The truth is, you, you don't have to be an asshole to survive in this business. Um, and I and I honestly don't think I think the business has changed a lot. So I go back to because you said that before. I think the my counterparts at various studios and the people who have really that run all these studios are really good people. They're not as nice as you. Uh, they're, 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 they're my friends, and they're actually a good group of people. And, and they are, those, but, but you're, you're, you're partic you are, you do, you do, you are well, different from them. Well, I don't know. I, I, everybody has their own kind of style. But I, for me, a corporate culture, you know, I always think uh, it's about people first, and you have to have the right people in place. And if you have the right people in place, then you have to put the right culture in place. And the right culture is is making it a place that people want to come to work. I know it sounds corny, but we all spend more time, those of us that have square office jobs, spend more time at our job than we do at home or doing any of the things that we really enjoy in life with our family or doing anything else. So you want to make it a place that people feel good about being part of and being proud of being part of. And how do you manage one of the things? Well, um, the, the last part I'm saying. Oh, excuse me, and, go ahead. And, and I believe that only it's because it's the most important part. I think if you have those two things in place, uh, business follows. I think that in America today, in many businesses, I think they probably don't feel that way. Uh, I've had the, the good fortune that the people I've worked for have allowed us as a company to operate that way. Um, most companies probably don't. Probably they, people are there first, in some form, because you have to have the right people doing the job, and then you immediately go to business. Culture, sort of follows. If you if you get the right people and the right business in place, then they're okay with culture. But I honestly believe that most companies in America, I can't speak to outside of America, and I'm not going to mention the entertainment business, but in general, I think most companies value business over culture and results. And I think you're you have shareholders to answer to, you have a lot of a lot of uh, responsibilities. And so these these it's certainly in our business, in the entertainment business, the bet is so big. That these companies can no longer be owned by Jack Warner or Daryl Zanuck. They have to be owned by conglomerates because you can't stay in business if you don't have very deep pockets and ability to to manage the company that way. So anyway, sorry. That so do you? Th so so just to dig into a little bit more what you're saying. Do you think it's about picking when you say when you say people over business, or do you think it's about choosing people who have kind of good the same ethics and morals than you do, or what? What do you mean when you say that? Yeah, I mean, 
I think you certainly none of us are born knowing how to do any job. So, you know, I always joke about it. When you go to see Circus Soleil and someone's standing on one finger, they weren't born. They're not magic people. They, they learn to do something. So we are just learning to do a job. So I believe smart people, people that care, can learn to do almost any job sooner or later. They may not survive in it, but eventually we can all learn to do something that we really want to learn to do. Um, uh, I'm always amazed. I think, you know, you, I mean, not to plug an NBC show, but if you watch America's Got Talent, look at the amazing things people do, with the astounding things. That I'm always amazed by it. And so uh, we can all learn to do these kind of bonehead jobs, um, you know, in one form or another. Um, so yes, I think that you have to get the right people, people you feel comfortable with, people that you, you want to be in business, people that you're proud to introduce to other people. Um, I, I think you don't always have that luxury, but I think more than not, you, you have to have that luxury. And you need, that's how you have to start. If you don't feel good as part of a team, I don't believe a, a large company can really do a good job. And how do you manage, this is, a, this is more of a personal question because I've always wondered this, how do you make, you're doing a huge negotiation with your old colleagues at CAA and you don't get the deal or you feel you overpaid for the deal or you feel it's a bad deal. How do you um, not get too emotional about that? And how, do you, how do you move forward with that? I know that's something that I struggle with all the time. I'm struggling with it right now. Look, I, I've always felt that, that a good deal is one that both sides feel a little bit had. Um, that's, when you, that's when it's worked the best. And both people feel they've left something on the table. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I wish I could tell you that CA does some special favor <laughs> for me. Uh, they don't. You know, they they have great regard for me, and they look at me as a, a founder. But it's been you know, 40 years since we started CA, and, and 20 years that I've been gone. I, I I have as close a relationship with other agencies as I do with CA. So so I don't feel any different one way or another. I. I, you know, I, I want us to win always at Universal. Do you get mad personally st st over deals and over business stuff still, or less yeah. or more, more, more than you used to, less than you used to? Uh, you know, I do my best not, I have a stupid temper. <laughs> so I do everything I can not to, to let it show, because uh, I usually end up doing things that I so regret later that uh, I do my best not to let it get there, but it happens, and sure, people piss me off, and, and I show it. Um, 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 one of the things you said is the business has changed uh, over the 20 years since you've been at Universal. So I'd love to hear, in your words, kind of how you think the business has changed, both generally, and then I'd also like to think how your particular position at Universal is different now than it was five years ago or 10 years ago, or, or obviously even when you started. Well, I, I'll go to the last one first. Uh, my, you know, for some reason, when, when I became vice chairman, People were, were sending me flowers and wishing me well in my retirement. Um, I didn't retire. I wasn't planning to retire. I have still three and a half years left on a contract. I think that, no, that's a scary, but, vice chairman's a scary big title. Why, would, well, why do you say that? Well, no, I'm not, no, but people did think that I was sort of kicked sideways or whatever that was. And they got confused with Chairman Emeritus. Well, I think in, in some <laughs> ways, but no, it didn't, it, it, my, my job didn't change that much. Um, it gave me broader responsibilities, so I, I still, and, and on a daily basis involved with the motion picture and theme parks and physical studio. But being a vice chairman of, of NBC Universal gave me a broader uh, area of responsibility. So I'm able to be involved with news people, with the, with the uh, morning people, with the business news people, with the late night people, with programming in some cases. So, um, you know, it, it gave me a, a, a broader portfolio and actually I enjoy it quite a bit. What, what's the most fun part of your job, do you think, today? Oh, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I, as I've become a, a universal, NBC universal groupie. I love the studio. I love the place. You know, I, I never get past the idea that I'm driving into a movie studio. You know, I grew up in Los Angeles. So the idea that I kind of drive into a movie studio and a guard waves at me and he doesn't stop me and search me <laughs> always <laughs> makes me feel great. You know, I think it's a, you know, it, always, it still fascinates me. You what know? about what's the worst part? Well, the worst part is always firing people. It's the worst part of any job. You know, it's, I mean, yes, you, you want to have hit movies, you want to have hit television shows, you want things to work, but that's business. You know, firing people, it, 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 you never get past it. And no matter what people say, you know, we all tell people, oh, you're, uh, you can be better off, or this, that's bullshit. You know, you're not better off. You know, you've, you've irrevocably changed someone's life, and you know they hate you forever and should hate you forever. And so there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no good that you smile at each other and pretend everything's fine and it sucks, you know. And there's no, you know, so there's no good thing, no good way. You, the first, you go back to the first question. 
You said what? You asked me the, the first question was just generally how um, how you think the business has changed oh, so in the last in the last in the in the last you know ten years or twenty well, years. Well, I mean, look, I, I'm a real believer in the movie going experience. Yes, there there are many other ways to watch movies, and the, the screens at home are this size now. But in truth, I, I still believe there's no better communal experience in going to the movies. I think it's cheaper than a rock concert, than a play, uh, than a book, uh, it, it is, than a sporting event. It, it is the greatest communal experience ever created. I don't think it's going away. I really don't. I think, you know, I think it's our responsibility as, as content providers to make it as good an experience from a, a visual standpoint, an entertainment standpoint, and it's the movie theater owners, the exhibitors, responsibility to make it a comfortable one, that the food is good, or as good as it can be, that the seats are comfortable, that you're not in some you know, environment where the seat is tilted the wrong way and you're, you had gum all over the floor. Um, but I think it's really, the, you know, it's the greatest, whether you go alone or with someone else, it's the greatest communal experience there is. And so that part hasn't changed. And I think that will continue, no matter what people say about the demise of the movie business, it ain't going anyplace. Um, uh, we just have to be good at it. Um, What's changed really is the bed is so big. It's what I said before about the ownerships. You know, if you look back at films, uh, great, I mean, I don't know, Jaws, you know, would cost $6 million. You know, today Jaws would cost, you know, $230 million. The first, the first um, micro budget movie, Jaws. Yeah, but so, but it wasn't. It was looked at as an expensive movie. If you, right. those of you, that you're, you're a young crowd, but, you know, when they made Heaven's Gate and uh, UA lost $40 million. It was unheard of. No one ever, there's books written about it. Uh, and you can find them. It talks about, you know, the demise of the movie business. Today, the bet is so big um, that it made those old days bets look small. Uh, the ticket prices didn't go up proportionately. Ticket prices went up from, you know, seven bucks to 12 bucks. Um, the cost of the movies went from, you know, six million to 200 million. And so that's probably the biggest change. I mean, obviously, various forms of distribution and how content is being exhibited has changed dramatically. But I think the basics haven't changed. The cost is really the, the, the biggest risk. And, and those of us who are trusted with the money uh, from whoever the owner is, whatever corporation or shareholders, whatever, you, you have a responsibility and you better be hitting bullseyes. You can't, you know, people used to talk about hitting singles and doubles. Uh, those days are gone. You, you better make hits. Um, you, uh, one of the things I read about um, is you, my, my, one of my big mistakes in my career is I, I missed Blair Witch, the Blair Witch project I passed on. And you talk about uh, missing Titanic. I read once you said it was the biggest mistake and once you said it was the second biggest mistake, but I wonder whether it was the biggest or the second. What were, um, how did that happen and what are some other either misses or kind of professional regrets that you have that you wish you had, you had done something different on? Well, I mean, Titanic is my, my first and tenth biggest mistake. I mean, it's hard, <laughs> hard to make bigger ones. Um, it, you know, it was, what happened was, and, and I, you know, I punked out. I mean, it, it was, uh, we had said yes to Jim Cameron for the domestic half that, uh, that Paramount ultimately bought and uh, verbally said yes. We, we were working out the arrangement and Edgar Bronfman, my boss, and he, he wasn't wrong at the time. He, he said to me, he didn't say don't do it. We were on a very bad roll. I'd, I'd had a, I, my first year, there was a bad year, and I was, I'd, I'd made a huge amount of mistakes. I was learning the job. I, I, I was in, certainly over my head in the beginning and, um, and, and trying to survive. And Edgar said, really, can we, they can make another Titanic movie. And at that time, there had been five or six different movies with Titanic in the title, Raise the Titanic, Sink the Titanic. Literally, there were numerous Titanic movies. I know it sounds ridiculous, but if you could find them, there's a lot of them. They all failed. And he said, really, is another Titanic movie going to get made? And I thought, do I want to walk into the face of that? I was trying to survive. And so it became easier to say no. And so we said no. Um, you know, I'm just getting over it now. You know, <laughs> so it's, you know. I understand, it, it, I understand. I'm helping, you know. But, <laughs> but no, it was, a, it was brutal. I mean, for, you know, for, for a year and a half, 
every day I'd wake up every morning and say, fuck, this movie is number one again, you know? And it, 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 it never went away. I mean, it just, you know, it was, it was, I'm not joking, it was brutal. I mean, and I felt like there was a big red light on me and say, well, you really are a schmuck, you know? So, you know, but uh, there's, there's no, I mean, otherwise, you know, I, I've, I've never been the movie picker, so I get blame and credit uh, for things that I shouldn't. Uh, they're great people, smarter people than me that really make the decision. I'm, I'm part of that process, but I don't. I mean, Titanic was unfortunately my 100% decision. Uh, and, oh, no, it's and, even worse. And so <laughs> I, I wish I could blame it on a lot of other people. But, you know, the only time, I, the only thing I, I can justify a little bit is that in the year and a half that it took for the movie to come out from the time they shot it, every day in the newspapers it was how stupid was. Fox and how stupid was Paramount they were making that movie. And so the I first, probably, so I, probably that been, was... I probably have been fired, you know, <laughs> well, before it came out, you know, if I had done it. So who knows, you know, it worked out fine in the end, but I, I do regret it. What about a, um, what about, what were, what were, what was like your favorite or some of your favorite movie experiences you had while, while you were at Universal? Oh, I, I look, I, the two movies that I'm, I'm the most proud that we did, yeah. besides Purge. Um, Thank you. Uh, but the the movies were the, the, the really the movies that were, I'm the most proud. There's a, I mean a lot of great movies, and and I am the recipient of of the decisions. But I mean Brokeback Mountain, I think was I, I love that we're the studio, even though it was done through Focus. It was our film, and I'm proud that we're the studio that did it. I mean I think it was a courageous film and a film that really meant something. Um, thank you. Uh, but it really was. I mean I'm I'm glad that you know and it, it turned out to be a hit. But that was never the intent. You know, you want to make money, but whoever knew that it would be turn out to be such an important film, and I'm glad that we were the ones. In. And the other was uh, United '93, um, which shows you, and it turned out to be a profitable film also. But it really shows you what a great country we live in, and what what people in the worst of circumstances can do uh, in the worst of times. And so it, it made me, you know, I I, I forget I don't know if anybody from the studio is here, but we saw it with the family, the surviving families. And for the first time, it was an extraordinary experience, one I'll never forget. So th those for me, are the, you know, there are many films that I, I love of ours, I'm very proud that we did. But those are two movies that really sort of stand out as, you know, when I'm long gone, you know, I'd like to be thought that I was at, I would, during my watch, those movies were made. And, and United 93, was there a, I mean, there, I mean, I'm sure actually both of those movies, but that movie particularly, there must have been a lot of, um, I mean, it was not an obvious movie to make, and it was very soon. It was relatively soon after. Was there a lot of deliberate? Did it almost not get made, or what? what, what oh, was, sure. What was, and what was the? Was there a specific thing that that got it green letter that you remember in that it conversation? Was just, I mean, no, I, you know, I, I don't. I mean, it was a, it was certainly for everybody that had to make the decision a tough one. Uh, but you know, Paul Greengrass was the right director at the time, and the working title, uh, you know, Tim and Eric were the right producers, and it had all the right elements. I mean, there was no stars in the movie. But it had, it, it was the right script, and it, and it felt like 9/11 had been enough behind us that it was time to tell a, the first story of, of a part of 9/11, and part of what you know really is such an important part of our American history. So it was it just felt it was a tough decision, of course, to make because it, it it wasn't an obvious financial success. It ended up making money, but it wasn't a movie you'd go into and say, oh yeah, we're going to do great. Um, it just felt like a story that needed to be told, and we were, had the right elements to make it. Um, uh, I'm going to ask you a question, uh, something else. Uh, how, how are we doing on time, all right? Doing all right. Um, you're, you're, you're very modest, but your, your career is pretty, it is kind of unparalleled currently. Um, you know, in Hollywood, and 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 I wondered: is there was there a moment where you th you f you felt the success inside you? Maybe you still haven't. Maybe you do. But was there a moment, either when you built CAA from the ground up, or at Universe? Was there one moment you were like, "Wow, I made it"? Or do you still feel like you haven't made it? Or what what what's what's your feeling around that? Question? I mean, I, I read this thing here. It was embarrassing because it says from mogul to legend or something like that. <laughs> I, I I'm not sure I'm a mogul, and I'm certainly not a legend. But it, but it it. But I've been around a long time. Um, I can more go back to, you know, I, I don't know. You know, there was a time when I was an agent, when I was at uh, William Morris, and I, and I, my, my biggest client was uh, Sally Struthers from All in the Family. 
and I and I really thought, oh, she was an important client. She was an important client to me. But I really felt my career was going nowhere. I'd been a messenger at Paul Conner for five years before I went to William Morris. And when I was at William Morris, I thought, and I really thought that I wanted to quit. I thought I couldn't do this anymore. I loved being in show business. I wasn't going to leave show business, but I was going to try to do something else. I think I was trying to get out somehow. I applied for a casting job at Warner Brothers. and I, I just I knew how to get out. And I, and I remember thinking that for me to succeed, all those layers of people ahead of me had to quit, die, or go to jail. And, <laughs> and, and I, I hung in long enough for them to quit, die, or go to jail. He's so modest. He's modest. He's too modest. But it's true. And, and, I, and so I stuck around. And, and, you know, at CAA, there was never really time. You know, it, it, it grew organically. It took a, a, you and I talked about it a little before, but it, uh, it, it grew organically. And so we never had started with big, we had little offices and card tables and folding chairs and one assistant for five of us. And, and it grew slowly. And so there was never a day when all of a sudden it exploded and said, oh, wow, we have a big company here. You just kind of woke it and just, it, it grew and grew and grew. And so, I, you know, I never felt as an agent, you know, you, if there's any agents here, you know, you, you, you're never 100% secure because you, you have, you're, if, if you really care about it, you're representing, no matter who you're representing, no matter what size client, um, you have a really serious responsibility. And do it wrong, you make mistakes, you know, clients leave, you know, for no reason, they, um, and it's not being disloyal, but you're dealing with their lives, and a thousand things come into play, and so I never felt completely secure there, um, until I left, I knew I had a business, I knew I was an owner of a company, and it was successful, but, you know, I, I used to use the example, uh, Tom Cruise was my most important client, he's still a very good friend of mine, those days, by the way, there was no internet, there was no emails. You know, you'd come home at 11 o'clock at night, and there'd be a message, urgent message at home on your service from Tom Cruise. And, but don't call after 10.30. <laughs> so you now know that he, he's not calling you to say thanks for everything. He's, he's got something, he's got a problem. So you now say, well, what time can I call him in the morning? You can't call him at 6. You're, not, you're sleeping with one eye open the whole night. You, it now gets to be, uh, uh, you know, say, okay, you know, call 7.30. It's a good time to call. <laughs> so you now call at 7.30, and the person answers the phone. and says, oh, no, he's on an airplane now. So you've now missed him, and you don't get him until the next day, and you are there a wreck. And, and that's being an agent. That's the life of an agent. So you never, you never sit back and say, oh, everything's just great. You, know, you, you never cure your patient. Your patient is, you're always in surgery. You, you're, you you leave the room for a while and go eat something, but you come back in and go back to the surgery again. All right, but then, okay, but this, so, so now, then you leave CAA, okay. then you get, then you have this fan, now you're running university, you have this big fancy job. Do you sit down that day and be like, okay, I made it? Is it no, the, no, because you said it yourself. It never happens. No one, I'm trying to, I'm hoping it, it happens. I, so, no, I feel very fortunate. I'm an old guy now, and so this won't last forever. But, and these are great gigs, but no, you, you never quite feel, you don't own it. You're an employee. And you have a responsibility, and, and they hire you to have success. They look at you cross-eyed when you have failure, and they're not wrong. They expect you, they put you in these jobs to make money and to do the job best, to run the company, to do whatever needs to be done. They don't, yes, we all forgive mistakes and do that, but you make too many mistakes. As I said, my first two years there, I, I, I'm amazed that I survived it. And I, I don't say that in any kind of modest way. I, I just, I made so many giant mistakes about personnel and about uh, business decisions. And I was in way over my head. You know, I had a, started a company with five of us with one si assistant that grew to 400 people when I left. I came to Universal and there were uh, 15,000 employees. And a number of them thought that they should have had the job that I got. I thought we were all pals. Um, you know, I always, I always joke about it. I was like, uh, you know, I was like uh, Cinderella's uh, stepsisters. Look, they looked at how Cinderella's stepsisters looked at her when the slipper fit. They said, "You, you're the one." You know, and they were. People resented that I was there, and so it took me a long time to kind of figure out how to navigate and how to make it work. And you have to make a lot of tough decisions at that time. So, no, I don't know. Yes, I'm, I'm secure in my life, but you know, 
I still, when we have a movie opening, you know, I, I'm up at four o'clock on a Saturday morning waiting to get the grosses, you know, and, and if, it, if it's great, we celebrate, and if they suck, we suck, you know, and, and I always think if we've done it right, then everybody deserves credit. If we've done it wrong, I got to take blame. So I, I, I haven't changed in that way. Yeah, we're, get, um, we're getting to the answer to the, uh, the nice question. I think it was a lot of it was right there. Um, um, you kind of, and, and we're going to do questions in a second, I think. Uh, it was one of the things I was, was curious about when you were talking about the transition from CAA to Universal. You, you interestingly kind of spent the first half of your career building and then as a seller and the second half as a buyer. And I wonder if there's anything, you know, you wish a seller knew with the experience you had or you wish, a, you, wish you knew as a seller now that the experience you've had as a buyer being on kind of different sides of that desk. Is there anything that, um, that the other side should know better that they don't? Yes. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> A lot of no, things. No, no, I'm kidding you, but it, yes, a lot of things. I made huge mistakes. You know, the, you, you know, you, you love your clients as an agent, and you should love your clients or care about them. And you have to, you know, once you become a buyer, you 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 have to look at things differently. And people you believed in doesn't mean you don't believe in them the same way. But you know, we created monsters at CA in many ways. We raised prices for people, and all of a sudden you become a buyer. You have to reevaluate how much you're going to pay people and why you're going to pay them, and you know it, it's it was a, it was a very tough transition. I had a, a, a lot of tough learning experiences. I made a lot of mistakes. I, I made deals I shouldn't have made, and I was I was really responsible for them. So it was a it was a huge learning experience for me. I I always say the difference in the two businesses. When I was a, a an agent, I had seven days a week, 24 hours a day of anxiety. Um, uh, in this job. Um, I have a lot of pressure, but very little anxiety. Uh, much better, you know. <laughs> so, but there's a, there's a diff big difference. Um, should we uh, should we do some questions? I'm I'm. Uh, is this how many minutes we have? Five minutes left? Is that right? Or I, I'm confused. But anyway, does it, do we should we want to open it up to some questions? Or I can keep going. It's hard to see if anyone has a question. There's a question. Yes, right there. Yeah. Go ahead. I'll repeat it if you want to just ask it. Hi, Sam Nodowitz. Um, so you've talked about how you've, the, the questions around, you know, how you've been a leader over the past many years, and you mentioned we're a young crowd. Something that I always struggle with is how do we become, how do we remain tastemakers and how to remain current? Um, maybe it slightly become, comes natural, you know, growing up more the digital age, but what's the long-term solution to that? Well, I, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. You have to, when you say, how do you stay current as a tastemaker? Or yes. did I get that wrong? No, that's the question. Well, I don't know. I mean, the truth is, it's a, it's a young person's business. And I'm certainly not anywhere close to as current as the, the young people who really make the day-to-day -day decisions, running the movie business, running the television business. Um, it's what they do. They do it better than I do. They have a different taste level than I do. I've, I found it in my 50 years in this business, my taste has changed drastically. Things that I thought I would never like, I like, and things that, uh, you know, I'm, and, I'm, and in many ways it shocks me what a squarehead I've become. Um, but, uh, I mean, I want to be entertained, love to be entertained, but I'm a, I become a tough critic, too tough. And um, so I think it's a, a very, many ways a young person, I try to stay as current as I can, I read a lot, and I'm, I'm interested in what's going on, but I'm, I'm nowhere close to as current as the people who are on the line on a daily basis. And, and you know, whether I should be or not, I don't know, but, but that's really their job and their responsibility. And I, and I would trust their instincts over mine about more what audiences taste are uh, today. I, you know, I've got, I have a different taste than, than a younger person does, and the younger people are the ones who are going to, you know, put butts in the seat. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? Yeah, right here. All right, hi. Um, so what advice, spinning off that, would you give to, I guess, the younger generation on success, just as a whole? Or maybe what advice, you, 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 you talk a lot about, um, do you still think the best way to break into the business is like being an assistant at an agency or a studio? And what kind of advice do you give people who, are, who hope to have a career, you know, a third as good as yours? 
Well, I, I, there's, there are different parts to it. Uh, look, I, it depends what you want to do. I think being in an agency is the, the best overall training program there is. Um, the problem is that if you really don't want to be an agent, it's not a great job to have. I mean, you know, when you go to an agency mailroom, uh, the first six months are for your education. Whoever, you know, if you come in green from college or wherever you're coming in from, you know, it's for your education. So you're learning a lot and you're absorbing a lot. The next year and a half or two years is for the agency's productivity. You're there serving a purpose for the agency. You're delivering and, and picking up and, and assisting and doing a lot of different jobs there. They're great jobs, they're fun, but you've learned in many ways a lot of what you need to know. You've learned who's where, who's doing what. You, you get a, a good part of that education in those first six months. The rest of it is you're fulfilling a function for that company. It's a great function, especially if you want to be an agent. It's a necessary function. But if you don't want to be an agent, you spend that time at an agency, you're putting a lot of time and energy uh, into an area that you might not get the reward from. Uh, but it's a great education, and it's a great training program. Um, studios, unfortunately, really don't have good enough training programs. We're all unionized. And so our mailrooms are professional mailrooms. They're not, you know, you don't put people in the mailroom and they work their way up. There are jobs to get, and certainly people work, you know, grow through the ranks at studios. They get assistant jobs, and they, you know, they meet people, and they find ways to, to become, whether it's a reader or whether it's a production assistant or whatever it might be. Depends what you want to do. You know, if you want to be a producer, you go find some way to get into a, a, a production company of some kind. You obviously, Jason, know better than I do, but serve coffee, do whatever it is. Um, there are ways to get into this business, I and mean, there are a lot of ways to get into it. I, you know, so I, I mean, someone said to me, you know, we were saying, how, you, how do you get, when you come to Hollywood, you know, how do you find a job? Whatever the job is you want, if, you, if you're in Hollywood or New York, because those are the two sort of entertainment capitals. I, the way I got my job in the agency business, when I came out of the Marine Corps, I, I, I won't bore you with how I, I learned there was such a thing as the, the agency business, but when I figured that out, I went to every agency in town. I went to every single agency in town and, and filled out what I thought were applications. I left my phone number. By the way, there were no answering machines really in those days. There, there was no emailing. There was no way to do it. You had to sit home and hope the phone rang. Um, I went everywhere and applied for jobs, and nobody accepted me. The job I ultimately got was, and I asked everybody. The one thing I did was everybody I met, every single person I met, didn't matter if it was a, a, my barber, the gardener, the guy fixing my car, uh, anybody, date, their parents, whoever it was. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not joking. I would say, do you know anybody in the agency business? And through that, I, got, I, w I was selling clothes at a, a, a men's clothing store when that happened uh, for very little money. Uh, $35 a week is what I was making. And, I, and somebody, my mother had a friend whose husband's sister was the brother of the woman <laughs> who, who, was, who was married to Walter Coner, who was Paul Coner's brother. And when their messenger quit, they remembered a guy named Ron who worked at a clothing store called Zeidler and Zeidler. And they called me up and said, you still want the job. Now, no other person called me, because I, I thought coming out of the Marine Corps, people would say, oh, well, you've been in the service. We're thrilled to have you. No one cared. I had no education. And that's what they cared about. And not one place offered me a job. That was the only place that offered me the job. And that was the difference in my career. There's always a way to get there if you really want to do it, if you really don't want to give up. You know, what happens to most people, they give up. They end up going to other jobs or other businesses, and it makes room for those of us that really want to find a way to get in. Uh, I'll, I'll answer the second part. Do say, once you get in, I was never the smartest person. I, I'm not being modest about it. I, I, I learned to do the job well. But I, I had certain fundamentals that really made the difference. I, I, I saw a, a saying once, and I, and I lived by it. It said, assumption's the mother of all fuck-ups. And it changed my life. And if you think about what that means, it, it tells you a lot. But I decided I would treat people the way I wanted to be treated. You can all, I'm a chump once. I won't be a chump twice, but I can always be a chump once. I would treat people the way I want to be treated. Do the things you say you're going to do. 
tell the best truth you can. You can't always tell the truth, but you tell the very best truth. You, <laughs> but you tell the very best truth you can. So I can't answer it better than that. And and you you and you work as hard as you possibly can. And no matter what job you have to do, I always say yes and thank you are the two best words. I said yes to everything anybody wanted me to do when I was building my career, and I thank them for letting me do it. So there's my, I mean. I, I, don't, know how we, I don't know how we can do any better than that. That's great, thank you, thank you, thank you very much.